Hello everyone and welcome to the Home Assistant Conference of 2020. My name is Martin Yelmer and I'm working as a Home Assistant Core Developer. We're very glad to see so many of you wanted to participate in this event and we're as excited as you are about tonight. We'll start with the opening keynote where we'll hear about the major milestones of this year so far. And we'll end with a closing keynote that have some cool new things to share with you that we think will make the start of 2021 great. In between the two keynotes, we'll hear 16 different talks about various topics related to Home Assistant. But not, not let's keep you waiting any longer and kick off the event with the first keynote. Here is Paulus Schrausen, the founder of Home Assistant. Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Paulus Schoutse and seven years ago, I started Home Assistant. Today, we're going to talk about everything Home Assistant. This is the first time that we talk about all our achievements from the last year directly and only online. We're doing this at our very first virtual conference. We've sold more than 4,200 conference tickets and many others are watching via YouTube. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Home Assistant Conference. The reason today's event is online only is because it's 2020 and everything is different. Wow. Of course, my slides are failing now. That's great. At the beginning of this year, a pandemic happened and everything that we took for granted has changed. Many of us have been homebound. T 2020 also brought a lot of personal changes for me. In May, my wonderful daughter Iris was born and in July, Together with my wife and two children, we flew from California to the Netherlands to move in with my parents. My parents live in a small town uh, close to a big city. It's a town where I grew up. And if you move back to some place where you grew up, you start to realize things, certain things that you used to take for, took for granted, they're actually not so much uh, the same anywhere else. So one of the things that I used to take for granted was cycling. See. And not so much cycling itself, but actually being uh, as a cyclist participating in traffic. Because I realized that when I cycle from my parents' house to the grocery store, every time the bike lane, which are physically separate from the road, crosses a road, cars have to yield. Whenever multiple bike lanes and car and roads come together, there's a roundabout, like you see on the slide, just so that cyclists always have to ride away. And we all know the Dutch are really into cycling. so. Of course, their cycling infrastructure is top-notch. But, but really, why is that? Is it cultural? Is it the food? No, it is because the system in the Netherlands is optimized for cycling. But this wasn't always the case. In the 60s and the 70s, the cars were winning in the Netherlands. Big squares in, uh, in city centers had been turned into parking places, and there were plans to uh, create a highway from the Amsterdam city center to the suburbs. There was also a big increase in tra traffic accidents and a lot of children were dying. So Dutch people from all walks of lives, they organized together and they started to protest. The, the idea initially was kind of waved away, but after a lot of energy to be put into organizing, they kept uh, mobilizing. Eventually the idea got some traction and then a bit more until eventually the system changed. The system changed and the focus became on quality of life and meeting people. And that meant there was no room for cars or limited uh, room for cars in living spaces. If you continue such a focus for 60 years, then you get the Netherlands today. It's an infrastructure that's optimized for cycling. Because people in a the system, they will, go, they will go along with what the system is set up for, the path of least resistance. So that if your infrastructure is the best for bikes, people will jump on a bike. And this brings us to the world of IoT, Internet of Things. Because with IoT, everything is optimized for clouds. Five years ago, Google and Amazon released their voice assistants. The business model of these two companies evolves around knowing who you are so they can better sell you products or show you advertisements. This means that they are selling their voice assistants for very little money. A lot of consumers either have these devices in their house or they use their voice assistants on their phones. Now, if you are one of these consumers and you're going to buy your next smart home product, you wanna make sure that this product works with everything that's already in your house. 
the only way you can integrate with those voice assistants I just mentioned is through the cloud. So now, uh, as, a, as a manufacturer who's going to create a new smart home product, you want to reach as many consumers as possible. You want to make sure that everybody wants your product. So that means that you will have to add a cloud so you can integrate with these voice assistants. And of course, when you have a cloud already and you're building an app to control your devices, you got to make sure that the app will just talk to the cloud. You're not going to add another local API because that's more engineering effort. And the incentives right now for manufacturers are to add a cloud first and a local API is optional. And we need to see find a way to change the system, to change the incentives so that it becomes the other way around. And things are changing, right? Like we see more and more people are talking about privacy, not just in like the general sense or related to social media, but also people are starting to talk about privacy in the smart home. We see this getting momentum and more major publications are picking up such stories. And this is important because to change the system, to change the problem, we first need to make people aware of the problem. Only once they're aware, can they start to care. So another event that happened in the last year around this is the introduction of Project Connected Home over IP, or CHIP for short. This is a smart home protocol initiated by big technology firms to control lights, smart switches, and sensors. Yes, not a smart home standard. But there are a few things around this standard that make me hopeful. The first thing that make me hopeful is that because these big companies are involved, this could actually get like a lot of momentum. And if Amazon and Google decide to both allow people, or allow manufacturers to integrate with their voice assistants through a chip, then we're changing the incentives. It means that the manufacturer might decide to add chip. If Apple Android phones, or sorry, Apple iPhone phones and Google Android phones also implement chip, it's yet another incentive for a manufacturer to decide to add this uh, protocol to their product. And if a product speaks chip, then Home Assistant will be able to talk locally chip with this product without your data ever leaving the cloud or without having to even buy one of these products of the companies that built this standard. And another great reason, that, another reason why I'm hopeful about chip is because they are together with the standard, they're building a reference open source implementation. This means that the, <clears throat> the code to implement chip is going to be available for everyone to use. And it means that the interoperability is gonna be great. It also means that software development to add chip to your product is gonna be significantly lower. And that once again, might just be enough incentive for product manufacturers to add it to their products. But I do have to say, don't get your hope up just yet. They announced the standard, there's been some open source work going, but it's not there yet. And also the product, the big technology firms that are like involved, well, they change the strategy all the time. So just because they help build the standard doesn't mean they will actually adopt it. Another thing that's really helping promoting local control and privacy is us, Home Assistant. We've been doing this for seven years and we've been gaining more and more momentum every year. On GitHub, where all open source in the world is hosted, we were the second most active Python project in the world this year with 8,000 people. Like this is 8,000 developers working on Home Assistant. Does anyone know any other software that has so many people involved? This is amazing. And actually our numbers are way higher because GitHub organized groups this by a project. And so they only looked at our core project. They didn't actually look they didn't count our community moderators, people working on the documentation, our front end, our mobile apps, our operating system, the list goes on. And as we get bigger, and as we are getting more users, we're getting more collective buying power. And this matters because money talks. We can start influencing manufacturers. And if you want proof, well, why don't you ask TP-Link? TP-Link decided last month to pull an unofficial local API from their smart switches. A lot of users were unhappy because this was exactly the API that Home Assistant was using to integrate the switches because we want local control. When we saw this happen and users were complaining, Home Assistant decided to organize. We make sure that we collect all the access TP link to, we make sure that we collect all the voices from our users and we organize this on our blog. That way we form one block towards manufacturers. And this works. TP link decided, okay, 
we're, we're going to partially roll this back. We're going to make an official local API and they're allowing other people to uh, opt into beta firmware to instantly uh, reinstate the local API. And this is not the first time this is happening. Uh, for example, two years ago, this happened with Logitech Harmony. Three years ago, uh, this, before that, it was with Philips U. Each time we organize and each time it works. But as we grew bigger, it wasn't clear what Home Assistant is anymore. Because initially we started out as a Python application. And that Python application, we realized that, well, if you ask people to install a Python application, we're building something for a really, really, really small subset. We want to be more accessible. So Pascal Fizzly then went ahead and he built a supervisor and operating system. This allows you to turn your Raspberry Pi into a home automation hub. You install it once and you can use it. But of course then people didn't know what they had installed anymore. We were trying to help people and that didn't work well. So we decided to change it up. HasIO, our all-in-one package, we renamed that to Home Assistant. The original app that we called Home Assistant, we call it now Core. But of course, we also have users that want more control. And so for these users, we allow them to, for example, if you don't want the operating system, they can just run the supervisor and core. Or if you also don't want the supervisor, you can just run core the way you want it. As we get bigger, so does our impact. And as we get bigger, it is great to know that Home Assistant is different compared to other smart home products. Heck, we're different compared to pretty much everything else. There are no investors involved with Home Assistant that won't return on their investment. We're also not backed by some billion dollar company that's doing this for a great reputation. No, it's a way smaller and directer relationship. We have Home Assistant, which is available for free to our users. The users can then pay Nabucasa for Home Assistant Cloud. When they do so, they will get uh, cloud services for the Home Assistant instance, like uh, text to speech, but they also allow Nabucasa to pay employees to work directly on Home Assistant. Nabucasa currently employs eight people working full-time on Home Assistant. These people work on the maintenance of the current features that we have and our operating system. They help with, they work together with collaborators to add new features to the system. But we also, uh, for example, when a TP-Link pulls a local API, help organize. We also organize uh, community events like our release party live streams and this conference. With the setup that we have, Nabucasa works directly for the users. It's a direct relationship. Incentives are aligned. And so for Nabucasa, they don't have to satisfy anyone but the Home Assistant users. And that's also why we don't see any advertisements in Home Assistant. We don't see advertisements on our website or documentation or our forums. And even a conference like this, we decide to sell a ticket. There's no profit on the tickets because all the costs are already covered by the users paying for Home Assistant Cloud. And Home Assistant is open source. And all the drivers that Home Assistant uses to integrate devices and services, they work as standalone uh, projects. This means that if a group of people or a company decides to create a new home automation product, they can actually start using our code. And we would like to see that because as people are using our code, they will inherit our vision for local control and privacy. Because we don't see other smart home vendors uh, that uh, also use local control and privacy as a competition. We see them as our allies because together all our users combined, together we are a voice towards the manufacturers to please make local APIs a default in the next product. Um, Sorry, lost track. Um, it's up to us all to help spread this message, to create the world we wanna see. So the next time you buy your smart home product, try to buy one where the cloud is optional. Ask your manufacturers for local APIs and support the products that are doing the right thing because the products that do the right thing today and have a local API, those will be the ones that can still work in 10 years. In the end of the day, it's your home, your data and your life. Let's work together to keep it this way for you and for everybody else. Thank you. Good evening from Switzerland. My name is Pascal Wieseli. 
I'm the founder of a supervisor and operating system. So let's have a look at this project in 2020. We integrated a new audio system, which allow us to share the sound card and settings across all add-ons and core. It's based on the Pulse Audio sound system for Linux. With a simple option, you can decide which input and output the add-on should use to play or receive audio. The picture shows, for example, the Spotify add-on from a community store. With this add-on, you can turn your Home Assist into a streaming target. Finally, we made it and integrated the network manager from operating system. Now you can manage the whole network over the supervisor panel. This includes Ethernet and wireless connectivity, but also virtual LAN for homes with complex network infrastructure. The Observer. It's like a status and help web dashboard. It allows you to get information without attaching a keyboard and monitor to your headless installation. If everything is running, you cannot see a lot of information to prevent data leaks. But if some things are unaccepted, you see more details that can help you to fix the issue. Don't worry about the port. You can use your smartphone to look up the port over the number keyboard if you're typing help. The observer shows the system lock also in the landing page. You can click on the blue dot to see what is going on in the background during the setup. On our operating system, we added the feature data disk. This allows you to have all your data on an external drive. The data disk is only useful for ports with SD card only support. With this solution, the OS gets booted from the internal storage and loads your data from the USB disk. This is our recommended way to use USB drives. We get the full advantage of the Linux kernel and hardware support. It works on all our supported platforms. It boots fast without any latency issues or other downsides like we know from USB boot. Here you can see all, uh, all our supported platforms. From left to right, it's going more powerful. One of my favorite is the Auto Read N2 Plus, added this year with release 4. It's cheaper than the Intel NUC, but has almost the same power. It comes with six ARM cores around 2 GHz and the excellent passive cooling design. You can attach a high-speed eMMC storage up to 128 GB and a battery to use the real-time clock on top. This board gives the best user experience on a single board computer for using Home Assist. It's the first choice if you need a new hardware. We're working also with other projects and companies to improve our hardware support. And we recontribute our bug fix back in example to Linux kernel. Our major goal in 2020 was to improve the quality and stability of supervisor and operating system. The first step was to limit our supported scope to increase the quality and test. As next step, we integrated Sentry as opt-in feature. Sentry can automatically send all troubles and crash from your local instance. This tool help us to understand bugs and issues which was happening in your homes. Thanks for everybody who shared this information with us. Like you can see in the screenshot, we can sort and track issues based on affected installation and a lot more. With Sentry, we identified and resolved over 100 bugs this year. Thanks for your attention. I forward now to Frank. Hi there, I'm Frank, and welcome to my office in the Netherlands, which is, by the way, also my living room, kind of normal these days, I guess. But that's not why I'm here today. Today, I'm here to talk to you about automations and scripts. So in this department, a lot has changed past year. Like the engine has been extended quite a bit, mainly empowering our advanced user base. And we have added a ton of new features to the YAML-based configurations, allowing you to do more with less configuration, but also allowing you to do the same with less automations. And a lot of these new features have been added to the UI as well, which is really great. A small warning though, there's really too much to talk about, so I will go over some of the most impressive changes only tonight. 
It all began back in February, when the first relatively small addition was made, brightness step-in. It allowed changing the brightness of a light relatively to its current brightness. And while this sounds logical and sensible, we didn't have such a thing. And I think this might have triggered actually all the changes we had this year. This year brought you repeats and loops. These repeats allow for repetition, 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 sorry, this is a really bad joke, of a sequence of actions. So you can repeat a sequence of actions multiple times. It comes in three flavors, a counted repeat, controlling how many times the sequence is repeated, a while loop that keeps repeating as long as the conditions are met, or a repeat until, which is a sequence that runs at least once, and after that will repeat until conditions are met. Next up is the chooser, for which I first of all want to thank Phil Bruckner for, as this is his amazing work. So the chooser is probably one of the most important pieces added this, to the automation engine this year. It's capable of choosing which sequence of actions it should run based upon conditions. And this allows for the so-called if else or switch constructs that are really helpful. And this example here on the slide shows one automation that controls two buttons. Each of those buttons have different actions. And this really helps reducing the amount of automations one generally needs, as a single automation can now do two different things. And then we have the wait for trigger action. It allows to hold the current automation until another specific trigger fires. For example, Home Assistant can send you an actionable notification saying, hey, you left the garage door open. Shall I close it for you? With two choices, a yes or a no. And the wait for trigger can wait for your yes or no response. And based, up, based upon like your answer, it will take the right action. So I've been rambling for a bit already, but the truth is there is a lot more, like run modes to control what happens if a triggered automation is already running, sub-second position, and the not condition a shorthand syntax style for condition templates. And you can now use entity attributes in triggers and conditions, removing the need for those templates in those cases. We have native data types from templates, making it possible to work with lists and mappings now. And variables, yes, we have variables now. So, but foremost, a lot of these performance, a lot of performance improvements have been made past year. Like a lot of performance improvements, like a metric ton of performance improvements. And honestly, I even left out all the little things that have been added or improved. So summing it all up, it has been an awesome year for a scripts and automation engine. And that's all I have for you. I'm passing you along to Bram. Enjoy the conference. Hi, welcome to the other side of the Netherlands in my office. I'm Bram and I work on the front end of Home Assistant. 2020 was a busy year for the front end. A lot was improved in all areas. We made things better looking, we added new functionalities, we made it faster and we made it easier to use. Let's take a look at just a few of the things we did this year. When people hear front end, they immediately think of Lovelace. So let's start there. Last year, Lovelace became the default, replacing the old state UI. This year, we removed the state UI. When we did that, we got a lot of feedback from people that love to have the auto-generated state UIs next to their customized Lovelace dashboards. So we added the functionality to create multiple Lovelace dashboards. So you now can create unlimited Lovelace dashboards, and they can all have their own configuration. So you can have a dashboard that is managed through the UI, a dashboard that's auto-generated, and a dashboard that is managed to YAML all at the same time. Let's take a look at some Lovelace cards. The entity cards this year got support for headers and footers. So you can add elements on top of the bottom of your cards. 
This is great as it allows for cards, for example, for an area where you have a picture of an area on top and buttons to activate scenes for that area on the bottom. SAC gave our media card a makeover. It was inspired by the Spotify media card in Android and it takes the colors of the album cover. So if the track you're playing changes, so do the colors of the card. And we did a lot more in Lovelace. We introduced the calendar card, we introduced the entity card, logbook card, the grid card, and a lot more. But we also focused on managing your Lovelace dashboard through the UI. We improved our editors with support for more features so people that are not comfortable with YAML can still use them. And we changed our card picker. It now shows a live preview of the cards using your own entities. This makes it, make, makes it much easier to pick the card you're looking for. Another thing we added is the media browser. It allows you to browse for a song in your media collection on Spotify to pick something to play, but it also allows to link integrations. Integrations that provide media, like the recordings of your Netatmo camera, and integrations that can play this media, like Google Cost. And you can even play your local media right in your browser. In the future, we will also add support for the media browser in things like automations. So for example, you can pick an album to play when you scan a tag with the new tag integration. We also have this awesome new quick bar. It was added by Donny. By pressing C for comments or E for entities, anywhere in the UI, you will get this dialog. It makes it so easy to quickly find an entity or reload some YAML configuration without navigating for the page you are on. We will definitely add more comments to this. Let's move on to the configuration panels. A lot has changed here. We made a design early this year for how we want the configuration panels to look. And we have been working throughout the year on implementing this. We introduced icons for integrations. We group multiple entries of your integration together. And we now show you when an integration needs attention. For example, when it needs to be re-authenticated. Devices now have their own dedicated pages. It shows you all the places where devices are used in, like automations and scenes, and it allows you to easily create new ones. And integrations like Zigbee can now integrate to these pages. So you have all device information and actions in one place. Everything is just more connected with each other. You can add all the entities of a device to your love place with one click. And from an entity, you can easily see what device or integration it belongs to. And you can now upload pictures for a person right from the UI. Just drag and drop a picture in there, crop it to size, and done. We plan to take this uploader and use it in more places, like Lovelace cards. Another cool thing we added was the ability to edit and add zones through the UI. You can now just draw a circle on a map instead of having to search for the coordinates. We made it in a way that you can combine zones that are defined in YAML and that are created in the UI. And finally, we added dark mode. The dark mode will follow your OS settings by default, and you can even pick another primary color to use if you don't like or default blue color. That's all for the front end. I want to thank all the contributors this year and we now move on to the Companions app, starting with Justin, who will update you about the Android app. Hi, everyone. Welcome to New York State. Notice I say state, not the city. My name is Justin. I'm one of the primary developers for the Home Assistant Android Companion app. A lot's happened this year since we released the Android application. I'm gonna quickly talk about how many people we've been able to reach and how many people have helped us to get there. I'm gonna show you how far we've come with the app since our first release last year, highlight some of the coolest features that we have, and finally talk about what's coming next for the companion app. First up, our Play Store numbers. 
we currently have over a quarter million devices active and still rising every single day. And these are just numbers from the Google Play Store, not including unique users downloading from GitHub. Almost 7,000 of these users are beta testers, and I can't thank you enough for helping us ensure that we have stable releases. Our 6.7 star average rating puts us near the top of the charts for home automation categories on Google Play. This year, we've had 44 unique contributors with over 500 pull requests. As it stands today, we have over 27,000 lines of code supporting all Android phones and tablets running 5.0 and later. Like I said, we've come a long way since our first release last November. We went from a blank setting screen to multiple scrolling lists of settings that you can pick from. Our, for, our first release was actually less feature rich than the progressive web app that you could install on Android. Since then, we've added 62 new widgets and sensors ranging from your battery statistics of your phone or tablet to the last notification your phone displayed, allowing you to integrate with virtually any application that displays notifications. We're adding more sensors all the time, and I don't have time to go over all the sensors we currently have, so be sure to check out the settings to enable sensors that you might want to check out. <clears throat> so what's new with the Android app, you might ask? It's funny you might ask that because everything is new. This is our first actual release since, um, since we've been released. The first thing I want to bring up is our onboarding flow, which is now Google Play Store compliant. Um, this might not sound like a lot of work, but there have been recent rule changes around uh, applications and location permissions. So we are now fully compliant with the Google Play Store and shouldn't have any issues getting approved in the future. Next, we have the power menu. This offers native local control directly to your Home Assistant instance. There's no dependency on the cloud. This allows you to start scripts, toggle lights, change the temperature and more without ever opening the actual application and just long pressing the power button. We're, we were one of the first applications to truly take advantage of this new feature and we have plans to support more, more domains in Home Assistant in the future. The last item I wanted to point out was our widgets. Not only can you create a variety of different types of widgets, they're now editable. So if you make a typo or want to change your widget, all you have to do is change it and it'll instantly update on your home screen. Lastly, what's next? We're really hoping to support Wear, o Wear OS soon so you can do all the notifications, um, actions and whatnot from your watch. We're hoping to add Google TV support once we can fully support the onboarding flow. And who knows, maybe even Android auto support once we find a good use case for it. That's all I have to share about Android today. Next off to Zach to talk about the iOS companion app. Hello, my name is Zach West. I'm talking to you from San Francisco, California. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the iOS app which I've been a primary contributor for for the past six months or so in this coronavirus lockdown amazingness. Uh, first up, let's talk about what the current state of the iOS app is. So a lot of our statistics got reset when we moved from Robbie's personal account to the Navacasa shared account. It's unfortunate that we lost some of the historical data, but we can pull the current data. And part of the work done this year is removing Google as much as possible from the integrations we use. So, a lot of our numbers come from Sentry now. Sentry, like in the supervisor, provides us crash data and other user count information um, that you can opt into or opt out of. So we have about 150,000 devices on the past three or four versions. 99.75% of users are crash free, which I think is pretty good. Uh, could be a little bit better. I'd like to see three nines there. We've had about 400 pull requests from five contributors. Uh, this averages something like 100,000 lines added and 50,000 lines removed. It's been a very productive six months or so for me. Uh, and, and the piece of information that I'm very happy to see is something that we can only get through Apple's analytics. So for those of you who have opted in, the background battery usage percentage is under 2% for the vast majority of users, which is, I think, very impressive considering the, the goal of the location tracking is to know a lot of information about you. And so that requires a lot of battery management as well. And so over the past uh, year or so, there's, there's been a lot of changes. There's 
iOS 14 widgets, starting with the action widgets that you can see there to perform actions. Multiple complication support was added to watchOS and Mac OS app is, is in beta right now. You can download it on GitHub and soon it will be available for release. And the Mac OS app also supports things like the iOS 14 widgets. And so over the past several releases, there's been a lot of quality of life improvements and bug fixes. Things are supposed to be a lot more reliable now than they were. There's support for HLS camera notifications, which when you long press on the notification, you can see the live feed of the camera. There's been a lot of improvements for location tracking. And across not just the iOS app, but with Android and with uh, various integrations, there's now NFC tag support. So you can use your phone or other devices to trigger basically anything, but any automation you can think of using NFC tags. There's also been a lot of interesting work around actions. So actions can now automatically be created for scenes and they'll automatically sync between your devices using YAML if you would like. Multi window support for iPad was added. This is a little bit of the Mac coming back into the iOS app since they share the same code base. Um, and the watch I think is now very rock solid and stable, which is a huge improvement and all the features work. As you can see here, uh, you can also fill an entire watch face with only the Home Assistant icon if you'd like. I don't know why, but you might be interested in that. And so looking forward to 2021, there's some cool stuff that came available in iOS 14. I think the most interesting is local push notifications. So local push notifications require iOS 14, but it lets us send notifications from your Home Assistant instance to your phone or iPad or watch without going to Apple, without going to the cloud. And so one really cool use case of this is for your boat that's powered by Home Assistant or your RV or your cabin in the middle of the woods, you can get notifications without needing an internet connection. Um, this requires a lot of tooling on, on both the apps and in core and hopefully will come soon. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of potential for iOS 14 widgets. They are limited, but there's a lot of things we can express that are a lot similar to watch complications. So, if you have any ideas, feel free to post in the community forums. I'd love to hear them. Uh, the Mac OS app, it needs a bit more work. It's almost there. It's certainly usable in beta and you can use it to uh, watch your camera status, your microphone status and change automations based on those. And so that should be coming soon. Uh, and and multi-server support, I, I hear you. It's, it's a very popular request. It's also a very large amount of work. Uh, I hope to, I've started tackling this a little bit. It requires a lot of refactoring and a good deal of work to get it done. Uh, so how to help, file bug reports. Uh, if you want to learn Swift or iOS, please jump in and, and ask questions in the Discord channel. I've been doing this for 12 or 13 years now, so I'm super happy to spread knowledge and join the iOS beta, which is uh, slash iOS slash beta on the Home Assistant website. Uh, and, and a shout out to Skycrier, for example, on GitHub, who filed about six or seven watch OS bug reports, and that really helped trying to diagnose all of the issues. Uh, thank you. Hi again. One of my tasks is to, be, is to be the project manager for the new OpenCV integration that we launched this year. To understand the origin of the new OpenCV integration, we should start looking at the old CV integration and its limitations. The old integration takes a long time to set up since it's not ready until all the nodes of the CV network have reported in. It only supports a single CV controller on the same computer that runs Home Assistant, and the CV support is held back by an outdated Python wrapper, which only supports OpenCV 1.4. We wanted to make a better solution, a solution that separated the CV hardware and drivers from the Home Assistant integration, while still making it easy to use the OpenCV C++ library. This was realized when Justin Hammond, the maintainer of OpenCV, made Qt OpenCV, a wrapper for the OpenCV library. It's a service that allows you to remotely manage a CWay network with a daemon running in a Docker container. The OpenCV daemon is responsible for connecting to the CWay USB controller. And for the supervisor, we have made an add-on that runs the daemon. To connect the daemon to the integration in Home Assistant, MQTT is used as transport. Messages are published as retained from the daemon to the MQTT broker. And this allows you to reload the integration or restart Home Assistant and instantly 
get the current status of the serial controller and your devices. Using MQTT also allows you to put the serial controller on another computer than the computer that runs Home Assistant. And you can also use multiple serial controllers on different computers and have all the messages routed to the integration in Home Assistant. The OpenCV daemon runs the latest version of OpenCV based on version 1.6. This means that new devices that require this version can be supported. And since we're using the latest version, updates to the device database config settings will reach users faster. For this release, we made it more easy to set up the integration for users running the supervisor. Just start the setup of the integration from the GUI and everything will be set up for you. And you can configure the USB path and network key. And if you already have the add-on installed and running, you will now also see a discovery notification for the OpenCV integration on the integrations page. Click configure and then confirm the setup and you're done. To make it easy for you to, to move over from the old integration to the new integration, we are working currently on a migration wizard. Keep your eyes open for this next year and also the end of the beta period in the first quarter. Finally, I'd like to thank all the contributors that have worked on the OpenCV integration and add-on during the last year. Many people are helping moving the project forward, either by opening an issue, reporting a bug, or by adding new features in a pull request. We appreciate all the help and feedback we get from the community. Thank you, and see you next year. All right, that's a wrap for the opening keynote. The conference is now going to continue with three different tracks. The first track will be on the main stage, which is what you're watching right now. The advanced users and developer tracks are on the other stages. If you're watching on YouTube, the, st the live stream is only limited to the main stage, but it's not too late to still go to homeassistant.io, go to the conference page and buy a $1 ticket to join, look at the talks at the other tracks. Another thing for people watching the YouTube, between the talks, it might look like the stream is buffering or that it's not working on your end. That's actually on our end. This will be automatically resolved when the next speaker starts. In two hours, we're going to be back on the main stage with the closing keynote, in which we're going to have some great announcements that are going to shape the future of Home Assistant. Enjoy the talks. Hello, everybody. This is creating the ultimate morning routine. My name is Joris Rovers. I'm at Joris Rovers on Twitter and Joris on Discord. And everything I'll be talking about here, you can also find on my GitHub profile. That's Joris Rovers slash Casa. Does this picture look familiar to you? You've had a rough night. I can tell you that's not my happy face. And that morning caffeine grip, well, this happened to me quite a lot. And honestly, it still does. But one day I woke up and I thought, can I at least automate the boring part? And so, of course, this is where Home Assistant comes to the rescue. So what I'd like to do is actually walk you through my morning route throughout the house as I get up out of bed, wash up in the bathroom, transition via the hallway in the living room into my kitchen where I grab some breakfast and coffee, and then ultimately end up in my home office where I start working. So I'll, what I want to do is walk you through the route through each of these six rooms and talk about the op automation opportunities that exist in each of them. So let's get going and start with the bedroom. So as I wake up in the morning, I don't use a regular alarm clock, but I use an application or an app called Sleep Cycle, which is one of those uh, smart alarm clocks that wakes you up, not at a specific time, but within a time bracket that you set, it sort of listens uh, to whether you're snoring or when you're waking up, right? And then it wakes you up at the right time. But one of the things it also does is uh, when it starts playing music, it can also integrate with Philips Hue if you have the, the premium subscription to Sleep Cycle. And that can actually act as a wake up light. So this is in the special color. The picture right there is my nightstand lamp and it's just a, a simple uh, Hue light bulb that's plugged in there. Now, the reason this is important is because 
that's actually the trigger for Home Assistant to figure out, hey, yours has waked up, right? So when that nightstand lamp um, turns on and the house is still in sleeping mode, I'll get back to the house mode in a second, and it's a working day between 7.30 and 10, then the morning routine can actually get started. So what I usually do is I browse my smartphone a little bit, a little bit, and at some point I actually get out of bed and walk into the bathroom. At that point, Home Assistant already knows that I'm up, right? So what it actually has already done at that point is turned on the lights in the bathroom. And I use the IKEA thread free light bulbs for that. And the, when, when it does that in the morning, when those lights turn on, the, the color temperature is actually set to a bright white as that helps me wake up in the morning. What also happens is that the bathroom music is playing at that point. Uh, I have a Sonos Play, one device in my bathroom, and I use an early morning playlist from Spotify. And the nice thing about using Spotify is that that playlist actually changes over time automatically, right? I don't have to manage it. Yeah, that is a curated playlist. And then the last thing that happens is that the mirror in my bathroom is turned on. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. So this is me in my bathroom looking at the mirror. And one thing you notice is that part of the mirror is actually fogged up and another part is not, as I've uh, just taken a shower. And so the way that works is that I've actually stuck a mirror heating pad to back of the mirror. And so this is a self adhesing pad. It's flexible and has wires through it that if you supply electricity, it actually warms up and it prevents the mirror from fogging up. And so what I did is I hooked up the light in the mirror together with the mirror heating pad plug that into a smart plug and have that talk to Home Assistant. So now when the bathroom lights turn on, I can actually have the mirror with both the heating pad as well as the light turn, turn on as well. Awesome. At that point, I've, I basically do my business in the bathroom and I exit the bathroom and I turn off the bathroom lights using just the, a wall um, um, controller, right? Nothing special there. Um, but as I turn off the bathroom light, right, something else happens. It's um, when the conditions are that the house is still in sleeping mode, it's past 7 a.m. I don't want this to happen in the middle of the night if for some reason I happen to turn on the bathroom uh, lights or turn them back off afterwards. But when those conditions are met, what actually happens is that house mode goes from sleeping to daytime. And I use a home assistance input select to do that. And when the house mode transitions from sleeping to daytime, there's actually a bunch of automations that get triggered in the hallway, in the living room, and in the kitchen. So let's talk about each of those. First, as I enter the hallway, uh, what happens is that the cameras that I have around my house for security reasons, they turn off, right? Not just in the hallway, but really everywhere where they're filming inside, because as many other people, I don't like to be filmed during my daytime, right? The ones outside, they just stay on. The other thing that happens is that the curtain in my uh, hallway that I used to keep some of the cool out um, actually opens up. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. And then um, independently from that is that the lights turn on and off in the hallway and in a couple of other locations like the toilet that is also part of the bigger hallway, right? Um, but that's independent. That doesn't you really use hall, uh, triggers in Home Assistant. It's just using motion activated sensors, right? And again, those are thread free uh, light bulbs and the light temperature also varies based on the time of day. Now, I've talked a little bit about, uh, or I mentioned the automatic curtain, right? And here you can see an animated GIF going back and forth. This is what it actually looks like. Um, but this is something I created myself. If we sort of stop the animation, have a look at under the cover, there's really two parts that you can see. There's a special curtain rod and there's a motor attached, right? And so the brand that I got, it's called Duya. There's other brands out there as well. Um, but Duya is available at your favorite online Chinese warehouse. And um, basically this particular model, um, it has its own smartphone app, I believe, but I don't really use it. I use it as a dumb curtain rod and motor. And I hooked it up to a smart relay, right? Um, and then the Shelly 2.5. What I did there is then I flashed ESP Home, which is a custom firmware that is very popular in the Home Assistant community, onto that smart relay, which makes it trivially easy to then integrate it over Wi-Fi with uh, Home Assistant itself. Now, of course, I already, in the top right corner, you can see this is definitely a bit more of an advanced use case, uh, but it works really well, and I'm, I'm super happy with it. Awesome. At this point, I've basically exited the hallway and I'm making it into my living room. 
And in my living room, it's sort of what you expect, right? The first thing that uh, happens is that the lights have turned on and there's a different playlist now uh, playing in the living room and in the rest of the house. But the second thing that also happens is that my TV morning dashboard is showing. Now, this is also um, more of a custom integration. This is not something that Google, or sorry, um, Home Assistant does out of the box. But what I've basically done is I've taken a Raspberry Pi, a small computer, hooked it up to my computer using an HDMI cable. And then um, as, I, as the house mode triggers from sleeping to daytime, Home Assistant sends a command, a rest, so-called rest command, to a script running on the Raspberry Pi that knows how to turn on the TV, open the browser, and navigate to my dashboard that I'll show in the next slide. Um, Home Assistant does allow you to do something uh, like this more out of the box using Homecast, which is beta based out of off of Google Cast, which most people know because of the Chromecast devices. Um, but this isn't something I've, I've personally um, experimented with or I'm using today. But basically, um, it looks uh, something like this, right? It has all sorts of general information on it. And so I usually sort of stop for a few seconds and look at what is the weather uh, for the day. Is there any rain coming soon, right? Is there any trash pickup? Um, are there any birthdays, any other important family events that are, are, not, um, are on the Google Calendar? And then maybe have a look at, uh, at some of the cameras around the house to see if everything is still okay. Cool. At that point, I basically exit uh, the living room and I make it into the kitchen. The first thing that has happened is, at this point, the usual suspect, right? The, light ha the lights have turned on, the music is playing. But then the other thing that happened is also that my smart kettle has start started boiling some water for some tea. Actually, that's not true. Um, I wanted to do this for a long time, but then I didn't. Um, I thought about this problem and after thinking about it for a long time, I took a very different approach. Uh, what I did is I invested a little bit more money and I bought a boiling water tap. Uh, this particular brand, the particular brand that I have is rather popular here in the Netherlands uh, and in, in other parts of Europe. But um, what it basically is, it has a seven liter uh, boiling water, um, well, a seven liter boiler that gives you, always gives you boiling water, right, on demand. And so I basically bypassed the whole problem of trying to cook water on demand or using a home assistant trigger uh, by just having it always available. And sort of the point um, that I wanna make with this, right, is as I've gone through my journey of home automation, I've learned that sometimes it's not just about um, using smart devices. In many cases, it's also about thinking about the problem itself. Automation and home automation does not necessarily mean using a smart device, right, to do the same. Cool. And then sort of I, at that point, I take my coffee or tea, my breakfast, I make it into my home office where I, I have my breakfast and, and tea and coffee. Um, so at that point, I use a wired cable, a wired Ethernet cable to plug in my laptop. And I use a very simple home assistant sensor, the ping sensor as a de or device tracker router. Uh, to sort of detect that I've plugged in my laptop. And if that happens during a work day, um, basically everything else gets turned off. The lights, the music, the TV, um, and the office lights um, turn on, the curtains in the office are opened. Um, I wanted to specifically call out the Workday binary sensor in Home Assistant, which I think is great. It's a sensor that actually lets you know whether any given day is a working day in your particular geography. Um, so it takes into account things like uh, calendar, whether your weekday, your week starts on a Sunday or a Monday, as well as local holidays. Um, and then the other thing I've started looking at more recently is the Home Assistant Mac application, which is currently still in beta, but I'm hoping to use some of that in the future to build in a little bit more intelligence between my laptop, my Mac, and um, Home Assistant itself, uh, because it does provide uh, a bunch of great sensors to Home Assistant. So at that point, my morning ride throughout the house is really ended, right? It's done, it's complete, we're here. Um, so what I wanted to do right before um, I wrap up here is really talk a little bit about creating your own morning routine. Um, the bad news is the state of home automation is still as such that it's not plug and play, right? Something is required to do something like this. 
Um, but the good news is that Home Assistant has made it so much easier. I cannot emphasize that enough. Even uh, during the keynote that we were just listening about, it's incredible how far Home Assistant itself has come, um, even over the past year. I've been doing this for almost four years, or almost five, I should say, and um, the, the speed of innovation in both the home automation landscape and Home Assistant in particular is truly amazing. Um, the, the second bullet point here under the good news is there is a lot of different ways to get to the similar outcome, right? Um, there's probably a bunch of people listening and watching this that have said, oh, but I do the same thing, but differently, or you shouldn't be doing it that way. That's a poor way of doing it, right? Do it this way. Um, I think the great thing about Home, Home Assistant is that it gives you so much flexibility and options, right? So you can do what works for your interest, your budget, your particular home, your routine, uh, and your family as well. Um, and I think that's pretty awesome. And ultimately, it is a lot of fun. So I can I can really recommend it to everybody. Really, uh, that was it for me. Uh, again, I'm at Yodis Rovers on Twitter and yours on Discord. You can find all the details at Yodis Rovers slash Casa. And there's a bunch more of my home automation stuff on that repository as well, like Walmart and tablets, a window opener I built. Uh, I have a bunch of other stuff in my stack like monitoring with Prometheus and Grafana and, and a bunch more things as well. So thank you again um, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And I'll be uh, hanging out in the open Q&A uh, room or session if anybody wants to ask questions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aaron, and uh, I'm going to talk about a short story of my experiences of putting Home Assistant inside of our off-grid vehicle. Uh, that's my presentation today. So uh, this is put into two pieces. The first one, is, first part is putting everything into place, and the second is actually implementing Home Assistant. And there's a bit of a story to show where this starts at, because I literally had to build this home from nothing at all. It was uh, uh, used to be a school bus, and uh, we'll talk about that here. Uh, I'm from Seattle, Washington, but right now I live in Mississippi. Uh, uh, my day job, I'm just an IT nerd. I do consulting right now and work from home. Uh, I've had a lot of hobbies in the past that dealt with large uh, vehicles and welding and home remodeling and all sorts of stuff. I've always thought about how integrated systems and stuff work in there. Uh, new hobbies include kids, I have four kids, and uh, so in 2014, we bought a uh, whole school bus that was uh, just literally un unmodified and started working on it. Uh, we wanted to try to reduce the amount of clutter and things in our life and see sort of uh, what we wanted to, you know, what that would turn into um, without knowing actually what was going to happen. So what we did is we, took that bus and and sort of waved a magic wand. One thing that led to another, and four years later, we have a off-grid vehicle. Uh, basically, it's got solar panels on the roof. It's got a gigantic lithium battery for storage. It's got air conditioning, internet, blah, 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 store, you know, sleeping for four people, four kids, two adults, the whole nine yards. There's uh, some links there if you wanna, if you wanna see what's going on. Um, that really started, to uh, that process of building that uh, was one that wasn't really that well planned. Um, I, of course, designed the systems to intricate detail and obsessed it over those a lot, but automation and controlling them all, I was kind of like, eh, I'll have some buttons to push. I look at the RV industry, there's just lots of control panels. I'll just want to get something done and make it work. So I really concentrated on all of the physical physicality of this vehicle. Um, you know, I thought, well, I'll just pick items and devices that sound good. So I'll be honest, I started reading Home Assistant reviews and how well does this integration, how well does that integration work and started choosing items based on that. So I, I tried to make the, I decided, I just deferred it. I was like, I'll figure out, make the smarts go later. Um, this did lead to some conflicts with how things were supposed to work. Um, but it was, you know, it was resolved. I just sort of, I, I made it work. Um, the criteria for selecting a, a automation and things were, I needed to look and see what I could automate and who built these things. Um, 
when I first started investigating this, I saw a lot of integrated packages for RVs, but you couldn't actually buy them because dealers wouldn't let you get them. You had to be licensed to use them. Um, and then I also connected this with what can you automate? Basically anything that's uh, powered and is a convenience of some kind. Um, what I ended up coming up with was having the core systems built by Victron Energy. This is all of the power systems. This turned out to be the monitoring, the, the solar collection, the charging controls, and all of these uh, devices have a lot of inter interconnected networks, uh, CAN bus, proprietary, semi-proprietary networks, plus ethernet, plus all sorts of stuff. The really, the clincher though, is that they update all of their information up to a system called VRM. Uh, it's a cloud, free cloud-based tool. And uh, VRM really helped enable connecting all of these different things together. Uh, you know, you can see the installation here of, of all the devices, all the integration, lots of things that got built. And a lot of this was built before Home Assistant really even came into the plan here. So what does that mean as far as how do you get to the point? Uh, idle hands. I really started out working with Home Assistant, uh, trying to just connect briefly to small things, install it on a Raspberry Pi like we all a lot of us have done. And it was okay. I was kind of like, yeah, I, that's cool. So I got the I got the weather for somewhere in Norway, I think. Um, I didn't really consider all this too much yet. Um, what I did do though, is started playing with what can I add this for information? One of the very first things I was able to add was resistive sensors that communicated over, uh, so I can't remember, it was some integration that kind of just plugged it in and worked. I started messing with stuff. Um, I got some good weather. I got some good information about my location. I had a previous panel uh, that was dedicated up inside the bus to be able to put it up there and I kind of shoved it up there. Um, but then, with MQTT and trying to figure this out, this is where it really started to shine. And I want to say that Home Assistant was also a bit of a platform for learning for me. Uh, I didn't really know MQTT existed before this. I went on some suggestions of other smart people that I chat with um, and found out that Victron, when you want to communicate with their devices, you have to do Keep Alive, another common thing in MQTT. And once that happened, I had thousands of items that populated in my MQTT tree because I subscribed to all of them. I was like, this is amazing. And so I just was like kid in the candy store, just trying to play with everything. Um, all of these different items, batteries, storage, uh, stores, like liquid levels to, to solar intake, to power output, to all sorts of things happen. Position, location, you name it, it's in there. Um, this made it to where I started harvesting a lot of, uh, in, I, I needed to start collecting this. So I was like, well, this isn't gonna get stored on a, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna set the, the little uh, micro SD card on fire inside of the Raspberry Pi. So the progression of how do I put this on an S, SSD drive and, and sort of trying to make it uh, self-contained in a way that I could not worry about it all the time. Is it gonna break tomorrow? Um, with the eventual goal of building this in such a way that I don't have to, play with it all the time. I wanted to get it to a point that was stable and facilitate that in, in let my family work with things. So, you know, bought an enclosure, tried to put it together in a way that would run off of something reliably in boot. Um, the, the idea though, was that I had to figure out all of these pieces at the time, because this is a little, this is a little while ago, um, and started trying to manage the configuration for it. It was already getting complicated. Um, however, I was getting really compli I was getting really fantastic results. Um, the but I was I was fighting with like the installer. I don't know if it was depreciated or not. You know, there's there's different ways to install this, especially with the SSD implementation. Um, basically, what it turned into is I got a lot of really cool results here. You can see in this little screen grab of things here. Uh, I can control my water faucets to shore power inlet to turning my heaters on and off and air conditioning and all the good stuff. But this is all managed through basically a control panel interface here. And this is then presented for my family to use it. Uh, the, the node red graph in the corner was to be the uh, automate myself, automate dad to turn the thermostat back down when the kids turn it back up this way because there's only so much power you can have in a solar powered bus on a daily basis for cooling or heating, uh, those types of things. So 
basically after iteratively adding a bunch of stuff over and over and over again, um, I really started to get the user interface knocked down to a, a, a way that made sense. It was actually A-B testing on a daily basis with the family. So they'd come up and push stuff and it would be different. And they'd go, dad, what is what is this? And I said, yeah, maybe you shouldn't push that. And then I'd go back and work on the computer and change it. So they can't change some critical system um, through the control panel or something like that. Because the system actually does affect physical devices that could be important to have like the water turning on and off um, or dumping the tanks or things like that. Um, I found that after getting Home Assistant up to a point to where it was relatively static, uh, my kids started be playing with the interface a lot more. They would watch it because when we need to do laundry, remember we're living full time. We don't go back to a house. We don't plug into an RV pad or anything. We're either living in the desert or at a friend's uh, yard or just on the road or at a beach or whatever we are. And um, basically we had to be fully self-sustained. And that meant if you do a load of laundry, you can do three or four loads of laundry with the power reserves that you've got, with the amount of water you've got. And so Hass was able to help me and the kids and my wife find where, uh, what, are we low on water? Can we time the showers? Because that is often a, a really challenging thing to do when you're living full time with only 100 gallons of fresh water. So we our, our actual water consumption was very, very low. And this helped control all that and, and really keep an eye on all that stuff. Um, it was pretty fantastic being able to watch the kids progress through not interested to seeing how this is all connected, um, watching when they turn the air conditioning on and having it cool off, but seeing the battery and the power and everything else and ask questions because we homeschool our kids. This all spiraled into all sorts of teaching uh, opportunities in that space too. So this is yet again, more teaching opportunities. It's been really astounding to have that. Um, there's just a lot of details that are in here. So uh, for example, the location sharing that was shown in the previous talk, I have to modify it. So our up, our location's updating all the time. So there's GPS that's being pushed in via GPSD. Uh, that feeds all sorts of actions like solar uh, angle and power usage and when the heater should turn on and all sorts of stuff to, to anticipate for that. Um, I use the Ubiquity controller for managing the network to be able to make it so the kids can focus on school things during the day. Uh, a crazy PowerShell Docker container that I sort of fit into this thing to to load in and talk to a lithium battery battery management system. Um, I started adding the, the lighting. All the vehicle lighting now internally was driven via Shelly's. Uh, I subscribed to Nabucasa because it's amazing for five bucks, gets you that reverse nap punch to be able to, to control the thing remotely. It's just really been a great experience. And there's so many other things in there. Um, you know, this is just a kind of a picture. I know you can scrutinize this. We'll probably have the slides afterwards, but there's, it's been a journey that the, this home assistant has traveled a lot, uh, 20,000 miles of road time probably, uh, and, and, and a couple, a year or so or more. It's been really fantastic having home assistant as an actual assistant in our day-to-day -day, uh, journeys and living. So after that, uh, COVID happened. So we sort of settled down a bit at our friend's place in Oregon, uh, United States. Uh, we then lived there for the summer, enjoyed the summer, had a lot of hobbies and things to, to practice on. But eventually we did find another house. Um, that's where I'm in, in Mississippi now. Um, we basically had uh, uh, put the bus in storage for now. Uh, we're not getting rid of it. We're just sort of pausing it. It's our home base for now. And we're able to uh, uh, sort of take a, a breather from constant moving. Um, home Assistant now helps me monitor it uh, remotely. So I can control the, the, the heating and cooling of it when it's in storage. If it's below freezing, you can turn the heaters on and just check it. It does automate it, but you know, just double check so you want it to freeze. And presumably in the summertime, I can run that air conditioning to keep things uh, within the comfort envelope for things. Uh, I recently did an update for HA, the containers, and broke it. So that's on me. Oops. Um, what it was was a realization that I built a really complex system. And uh, I need to try to figure out how to build this in a more scalable fashion. I still have foundational access to all the controls via Victron VRM, though. So... I'm not too worried about that. 
uh, it's it's sitting on my desk right there and uh, or my shelf, and I'm I'm planning on rebuilding that again. So uh, that's you know I, I think that this is going to be an even better version, and this is a learning curve for me. Um, I'm hoping that I can as as I can be more dedicated to this, that I can maybe contribute back to the community a little bit with my thoughts and ideas and put on our blog and whatever else we can do to try to, to, to message how to do this in a more complicated fashion. Um, so I think things that I've learned is Home Assistant is extremely flexible. It's, it is a, it is a all wonder multi-tool that lets you do anything. Um, MQTT, was really an opening to my eyes of, of how intelligently built that that uh, process, that protocol and, and method is. Um, it's exciting to watch all the devices and things go in there. Um, having said that, I think it's also important to consider what you're putting in MQTT. In my situation, there are certain things that I could have wired together that also could have set the vehicle on fire. Um, for example, if I had decided to make battery management uh, controller access to that, I'd be able to turn the batteries up in such a way that would break things or maybe uh, have the heaters have problems. There's there's concerns. So I think uh, keeping it, I for me, it was keeping uh, them separate. So if things go sideways, you can fix it. And then um, that's that's basically it. So I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, this has been really a great journey. And thanks to Home Assistant team for enabling our journey. Um, are commonly considered to have a high wife acceptance factor. The term is a tongue-in-cheek play on electronics jargon such as form factor or power factor and derives from the idea that men are predisposed to appreciate gadgetry and performance criteria whereas women would be wooed by visual and aesthetic factors. It's really just another way of saying, will my fussy tech ignorant wife who couldn't possibly share my appreciation for high end gear be happy to let this into our home? Louis Lipnick coined this expression in the 1950s and Larry Greenhill popularized it in a 1986 issue of Stereophile magazine. Lipnick's wife, actress Lynn Jane Foreman coined MIF or marriage interference factor, adding that audiophile husbands should balance their large and ugly electronic acquisitions with gifts to the wife made on the basis of similar experience expense. Today, 70 years later, this expression is still in use in many areas of tech, amongst others in our community of home automation. Some of you might want to say, come on, it's just a way to be funny. Well, here's a few jokes in the same subject, but at no one's expense. Instead of, I've published a 3D printable enclosure on Thingiverse for that all importance wife acceptance factor. Try saying, I've published an enclosure on Thingiverse so that your DIY motor doesn't look but as ugly next to your precious imported Venetian blinds. Others might want to point out that some women also use these terms or think they're funny. Yes, that might be, just like Nipnik's wife agreed with and expanded his expression. But the expression was coined in the same area, era as, for example, these ads. Is this really the views we want to perpetuate? I'll let you have a moment to look at these. So I was going to add in a piece here on my personal history about how it is to be a woman in the tech industry with typical manly interests like computers, games, and well, home automation. But you know what? I think you get it anyway. I think everyone deep down understands that a lot of women think answering a question like, what kind of robot vacuum cleaner should I get with, I don't need one, I have a wife is not very funny. Or how about simply the answer my wife to the question, what are your favorite automations at home? This is not to say acceptance factors doesn't matter. They absolutely do to everyone. And not just you and your spouse, 
but also the rest of the family. Do you have children or pets? Do guests come over? When most people say wife acceptance factor, what I think they really mean is a sort of an undefined framework for what is acceptable home automation when living with other people. It just happens to be offensively named by some dude in the 50s. When your automation or device is good for the acceptance or approval factor, that means it's scoring high on this framework. The intention is very good, but the name ruins it by enforcing incorrect stereotypes about gender-related interests and partnerships. Plus, it's simply far too limiting in its scope. Think of it more as a UX user experience for your home. First, you need to figure out what your intended users are. First, we have the most important ones, your family. These are your daily core users. They use and need a lot of features and consistent uptime is key. They can often get used to kind of weird or unfinished interfaces as long as they're consistent. They also need to feel safe and maintain a sense of privacy. Then we have guests. They are occasional users and need only a few features like turning on and off lights. Those features need to work at all times and have intuitive interfaces. Which interfaces are needed depends on your guests. Your grandmother might not be used to speaking to a voice assistant and the house sitter that comes when you're on vacation can't suddenly be plunged into darkness because the motion activated lights are on too short of a timer. Then comes a group of people that is very important and not often thought about, first responders. An EMT that comes into your home to save your life must not be hindered by not being able to turn your lights on. And maybe you have pets. Does the robot vacuum cleaner scare the cat or maybe you should only run it when someone's home? Or does the dog trip the motion sensors and therefore set off the alarm and scare you half to death? This can actually be a good thing to check for the robot vacuum cleaner too. And uh, what happens, uh, what about how the house works? Do you have an away mode? What happens when it's activated? Do your automations waste energy or water? Could a malfunction damage the property? And in that case, do you have security in place for that? Like perhaps leak detection for your automatic watering of the house plants? And last but not least, yourself. Do you like the overall product and design of the system? Do your automations help or hinder your life? Do they relieve stress or cause it? Obviously, you can never make a foolproof system that makes sense to everyone and is always working. But there are a few things that can maximize the chance of approval. If you don't live alone, talk to your family or others you live with. What do they want? Do they have any ideas of their own that you can implement? Do they agree that it would be awesome to do this new cool thing you read about in the forums? If they're hesitant, could you maybe agree to make a trial period to see if it works for all of you? And if you live alone, think of possible guests. Have a testing strategy or even maybe a development environment if you're really serious about things. You want to try out a new automation? Perhaps do the logic, but send yourself a notification instead of sounding a really high siren when your alarm gets triggered. Maybe there's a fault in the logic and your child comes home, the system doesn't see it and they trigger the alarm without knowing how to turn it off. Try it out like that for a normal week or so to find common mistakes. You want to uh, try out a new cool theme for Loveless perhaps, uh, but it happens to break the main view and now you have to go to bed. Try it on a secondary view that's not used too often or make a copy of your main view to try things on. Always make sure that the basic functions of your home is intact. Don't put all your trust in this new cloud-based thing, for example. When the servers go down and you can't get the water heater to work, no one will be happy. You can do this with the help 
uh, of these principle principles. First, we have the principle of least astonishment. It's often used in software development, and it can be used to describe what makes a good user experience. No one should be surprised by how your lights work. The clapper was a cute way to turn, out, turn on your lights, but it wasn't very intuitive. A component of a system should behave in a way that most users will expect it to behave. When designing automations, I like to think about a hypothetical neighbor who's coming over to feed my cats when I'm on vacation. They know nothing about voice commands and don't have the Home Assistant companion app on their phone. If they need to turn up on the lights, what would be the least surprising way to make that happen? Either the lights come on automatically or they'd use the light switch. So I installed smart light switches that turn on the lights. The next principle is the lowest common denominator. Use this to determine what automations to prioritize in order to maximize acceptance. What features do all of your users need? Make sure those automations are absolutely foolproof. Turning on lights, getting Netflix up on your TV or turning on the AC or heater, not waking them up at your automatic 7 a.m. morning workout playlists, etc. I think we've all done the presence detection, think you're coming home in the middle of the night and turning on all the lights mistake, or maybe the opposite, thinking you've left and turned everything off while you're awake. How do we manage this in the real world then? Well, this is gonna be highly dependent on your personal setup. I already gave you the example of using notifications to show you when certain automations would run before implementing them for real. You can also use, for example, input booleans to decide when to turn on or off certain groups of automations for, say, a guest mode to make your home more guest friendly. You can use these as conditions in your automations. Also, always have a fail safe so that you know how to turn off an automation that has gone haywire. And remember, always do a backup and read the breaking changes before updating. So that's, uh, that's it for me this evening. Thank you for listening to me. I will be in the Q&A. Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Hunter. I'm here to talk about not all integrations are created equal. So what about myself? Uh, again, Jason. Uh, I am a director of engineering at Red Ventures, GitHub at HunterJM, and on Twitter at HunterJM as well. I have been using Home Assistant for about the past two and a half years uh, and contributing for almost as long. With the, the TensorFlow integration, uh, the Xbox integration, uh, and have also worked on OnVIF as well as uh, stream and media source platforms. So let's back up a little bit and talk what I meant by not all integrations are created equal. Recently, uh, Troy Hunt a series titled IoT Unraveled, where he goes into great depth talking about his IoT journey. The first of which is titled, but then there is Home Assistant, which this quote is, uh, if you haven't read through that series yet, I do so. Now, don't get me wrong, as much as the next person. But I've made some questionable in the past that did by following some of the techniques that I'm going to share today. And honestly, it's a mess on the system. The talk is going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to tell you what to buy. I'm not going to tell you what's good or what. Most of that is dependent on personal preference and comfort. What I will be doing is outlining a framework that I hope one day will become irrelevant because in this utopia, there are well-defined classes of things that implement holistically the same basic functionality, all of it to us as consumers. Until we reach that fantasy world, however, following this outline allow us uh, to help, sorry, help us when 
your smart devices. So the format of this talk is going to go like so. Each of these bullet points listed will have a on that title slide, I'm going to share some basic information on your research. After that, I'm going to switch over to my web browser and walk through some examples for each. Because only 15 minutes long, I have roughly about 90 seconds per topic at this point. So hold on. So first, let's talk about I first let's talk about documentation. Now, earlier I held up my Nest Hello doorbell box when talking to you about just decisions. The first step that you should take when the device is to think about what capabilities that you would like it to have when integrating it into your smart home. When looking at a smart video doorbell, what things come to mind, chat? And a couple of seconds to uh, let this catch up. Doesn't work with Nest. Fast video response, yeah, and video image integration. That's exactly it. Two of the things that I'm looking for is a that would let me know that someone rang the doorbell. And for a video doorbell, a live camera. So let's dive into the docs. Uh, we have documentation. You've got the integrations page. And you can search for Nest here. Uh, more recently, with the great work being done, uh, Google SDM uh, is, uh, or smart device management, is there, there better integration now than there was when I first started. But when I first started, it was the works with Nest. And the legacy works with Nest integration starts off with camera. The legacy API to watch still frames from a video stream, not a live stream. And I did time that I went through here. The next thing is that are available, right? This is how we get our button press event in. But all through these monitored conditions, we have in a way whether a thermostat is on. And for the camera, we get motion detection events and person detection and sound detection, but we don't get a button press event. I purchased this before uh, reading through the documentation thoroughly, the uh, stories that I have of uh, not great person's decision by not reading through the documentation. So the next thing that we can see in the documentation is an IoT class. IoT class can be broken down into two parts, cloud versus local versus pull. Let's look at what the docs have to say about that. Here for the ring doorbell, uh, you can also see, hey, they can allow for live viewing of your ring camera from within Home Assistant. Binary sensor does give you a button uh, for front doorbell ding. But ring on the right hand side, we have this IoT cloud polling. And so if we information icon, it'll bring us to classifying the Internet of Things blog post from where we have all of these different classifiers. State, meaning that we're unable to get the state of the device. Cloud polling, meaning reach out to the cloud, and it requires an active internet connection in order to device, meaning we have to reach out every time we want an update and ask for a new one. Cloud push, creation of the device still happens via the cloud, meaning it still requires an active internet connection, but the device it's updates to Home Assistant, so those updates can happen in more real time. Polling offers direct communication with the device Local network, but it's still polling, which means we still have to reach out to the device to ask for state updates. Local is the best of both worlds. We get direct updates from the device happens locally without needing uh, an active internet connection. When we're looking at cloud versus local, let's see what Paul talked about this uh, in the initial talk. But on Twitter, he 
IoT buying guide. Uh, and so I'm just going to reference you guys to this. There's a, a nice thread of what ongoing costs a manufacturer has when you your home and how those costs are covered. We've all heard of Wink getting shut down or starting to charge a subscription fee uh, or multiple IoT cloud-based devices to shut down. Probably the biggest one uh, is, at least here in the United States, was Lowe's with their Iris information system where the entire system got shut down. What happens if costs are no longer covered? Do they just become bricks in your home? At the same time, like the likelihood of something from uh, a shutting down entirely uh, is, is much lower. So again, it, it's all personal. Integration quality scale is another thing that you might see on the right-hand side of the documentation. Uh, the possible score, silver, platinum, and internal. At Philips here, we see that the quality scale for Philips is platinum on the right-hand side. What does that mean? Clicking on platinum will bring you a scaled uh, article in the documentation. Where it'll say it means that the integration passes the bare minimum requirements to be included in Home Assistant. Silver, it can cope when things go wrong. Gold, it's able to survive poor conditions and can user interface. Platinum is best of the best, and then internal. And so this gives you kind of a, a uh, of what uh, the quality scale can be. But something to consider here, the of targeting a quality scale uh, is on the contributor documentation here has a checklist uh, for each of these quality scales contributor has to meet. And because it's optional, many integrations you're looking at won't be rated. And that even goes for contributions uh, is the Xbox contribution uh, and a quality scale there. It probably falls somewhere between gold and platinum, though, if I had to, to go through and do that. The next thing to take a look at uh, when researching a specific device to see if there is out for it. So the Home Assistant Alert site can known issues with devices or integrations solution in place. Now, it won't contain every possible issue that users experience, but it will that don't have any direct uh, site or line of. You can see that at alerts.homeassistant.io here. Uh, most recently, Docker 2010 had a with supervised installations, uh, but there are alerts, devices, TP-Link removing the local API, uh, the loop shutting down, and iCloud sign-in notifications every 30 minutes. So uh, again, as you're looking for integration, the alerts that are available for them. So now documentation, moving away from the doc site, the GitHub, this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time to get more advanced. In GitHub, one thing that we can look for is have a code owner. This means that a volunteered their time to maintain integrations, and they'll be automatically notified and assigned any issue for that integration. So let's take a look. The Xbox integration is one of my integrations, and in the document, you can click on here under source view on GitHub. When you click that, it'll bring you directly to the source code on, on GitHub where it is. The easiest way to check for code owners is to look here in this JSON file. And here you can see there's a code owner and Hunter JM is one. Uh, that's me. So any issues that get created uh, related to Xbox. Xbox integration label gets added to it, I will automate Another potentially useful tool is the Git history development activity uh, for the integration. That we're this is useful to an extent, but I want you to remember integration may not have any recent development activity. It doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't work entirely possible that the integration is so solid that the code owner fix any bugs. And so looking at issues, hitting code owners together is really important. So for this one, 
I'm going to take requests or, on integration, and we can browse the history together, and I can kind of on what to look for. And I'll go ahead and give that 10 second wait, uh, start catching up. Yamaha. So here on GitHub, I am in the core repo, Home Assistant Components folder. If I search for you, here that we have a Yamaha and a Yamaha Music Cast integration. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead. And, uh, Yamaha, uh, it was last updated four months ago. So if I go into Yamaha and click on this little history button, this will show me all of the commits to Yamaha here. Uh, but before I do that, actually, uh, let's take a look. And we see that Yamaha doesn't have any code owners assigned to it. Uh, so the fact that there's no code owners assigned to Yamaha means that there's no one really actively maintaining this integration. Uh, they are they haven't volunteered themselves to be signed up for every issue uh, that gets opened for it. If we look, the latest thing that we see is on August 27th. And that was Frank basically upgraded uh, Black some code formatting changes. If you take a look at this pull request that's linked to it, see that it touched 574 multiple integrations. Um, the latest change was on June 8th, where we added a service to be able to select a scene for Yamaha uh, Media Player. And just because the last change was on June 8th doesn't necessarily mean that uh, doesn't work perfectly well. And so that's where GitHub issues is the next and last place to look at. GitHub issues is how Home Assistant tracks all bugs or user issues for every integration. Integrations assigned a label, which makes it easy to track activity. Things to look for here include the issues for an integration, the comment history on issues, has a code contributor looked at and responded to the issue, uh, how many open issues versus closed integration. So are issues actually being addressed? And so let's uh, issues for Yamaha as the example. So going through here uh, in Yamaha, uh, this is Home Assistant. I'm looking at issues. Uh, I've got about a minute left, so I think we can do this in plenty. Uh, one of the things that we have for every single integration that we have. So if I click on this label drop and start looking for Yamaha, I see here we have Yamaha MusicCast and So I filter these integrations Yamaha, and I see that there are five open issues, uh, 15 closed issues. The oldest open issue eighth and the newest is 20 uh, where saying Yamaha media content ID does not always work so let's take a look here a ton of comment activities on these issues uh, meaning that they probably haven't been addressed by right so here we have a problem where not all the stations work uh, on on all these Here's the additional information. Went through and added the Yamaha integration, but nobody got automatically because there isn't a code owner for it. Uh, so we have just one comment from our bot that says the documentation. Here's how to look at the source. Um, and so I think a other example, uh, and I'm going to put myself on the spot here because I've been this conference that I've actually done a really bad job looking at recently. So I'm going to go ahead and look at the Xbox integration. As you see here, I haven't seen any or many of these. Uh, it's Hi there. I think I'm live right now. 
live from Amsterdam. Uh, happy to be in uh, this conference. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, we're right now in uh, the uh, fire station Duivendrecht. It's one of the stations uh, in the Amsterdam region. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, how Home Assistant can help save lives. And uh, I made a, a short presentation for you guys. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the fire department in Holland and especially here in Amsterdam. Uh, in the whole of Holland, we have about 30,000 uh, people who are working for the fire uh, service. And uh, 25,000 of these people are uh, actually in the, in the service of fighting the actual fire. The rest is uh, in the offices and in all kinds of departments. And of this 25,000 people in Holland, about 80% is a volunteer. So uh, a large part of the community of the uh, fire department is working as a volunteer to help fight fires. And here in Amsterdam, it's almost the other way around. We have like 70% uh, professional firefighters for it's a big city, they have to work a lot. And there are a couple of small fire stations. They make up about 30% of the, all the, uh, the firefighters in this region. And this uh, fire station that you see here is one of the smaller uh, fire stations. And uh, we make up this uh, 30%. Well, oh, well, we are having a call right now. So it may get a little bit busy in a little bit, but um, I, I see it's not a really urgent call. We're, uh, we're going to have uh, a car leaving in a bit, but that's okay, I think. Um, let me tell you a little about, bit about how the fire service works. Sometimes you have an emergency, you have a fire. That's uh, quite obvious, but we have other things. We have, uh, for instance, we, we help with calamity, uh, casualties, we help with uh, uh, water incidents. We're in Holland, there's a lot of water so there's a lot of incidents involving water cars uh, getting into the water or people just falling off uh, the, the side of the canals. So we have a lot of different incidents. What happens? They call 112 in Holland. It's the, the uh, version of 911 in uh, the States. Uh, if they call 112, they get connected to dispatch and dispatch uh, fires the emergency call. The emergency call comes to us as uh, firefighters, but especially the volunteers on our old fashioned pagers. We get a message saying what kind of emergency there is, and uh, we have to get to the fire station as soon as possible. Well, this is really the old fashioned way, but it still works like that. And uh, nowadays, uh, the emergency system is connected to another system. It's called Brandweer Rooster or also known as, oh, we have a bit of a, I'll try and continue a bit. It can be a bit noisy in the back, but don't let that disturb you. Anyway, we have uh, the system called fire. This is what happens in a fire station. So I can't help that. It doesn't take long, I hope. This is actually one of our biggest trucks here. It's, it's being used for uh, huge water transports. In the back, you see the ordinary uh, uh, fire fighting uh, vehicle. But this one is the bigger uh, version. Okay. I think the door will, it will close by itself. Let me continue. Um, we have a system in Holland and it's connected to uh, the, the dispatch. And it's called Brandweer Rooster, also known as uh, Fire Service Rota, because this system is not only working in Holland, it's also working across the border. And uh, it, it's quite smart. It's, it's much more advanced than the old fashioned pagers. So what it does, it sends a message to our uh, cell phone 
and it gives us more info about uh, the about the incident. And we can actually tap a button in uh, the app to say that we're coming to the station, so they know how many firefighters are on their way. Soon we're going to work with the smart pager as well, so we'll have some more functionality on the smart pager. We can actually press a button there and people know that we're coming as well. But it made me think because I was involved with home automation a bit. I got to know Home Assistant and I thought, well, there's a possibility here because it would be great if I would know that I have an incident and have my house react on that. Um, just reading the notes here from the 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 from the uh, backstage, but uh, but it's okay. Uh, I wanted to know: Is it possible to have my home react on a fire incident? And there's a, plenty of stuff you can do if you, if you know that there's an incident. There can be a light that is switched on, or I could have all kinds of info on a screen in my home. I could have the alarm being switched off, and who knows, maybe it's possible to unlock my car. When, when I go to the fire station, I, I want to lose as little time as possible or maybe even start the car, who knows? So I was looking into Home Assist and I was thinking, could I use this? Could I work with that? And it was actually not that simple. I'm actually myself an actor doesn't look like this, it looks like I'm a fireman, but I'm a volunteer uh, fireman. So I do this on the side. My ordinary job is an actor. So I can act, I can do, uh, I can be a firefighter, but I'm not a programmer. So I was thinking I have to find someone who can help me with that. And running around on the internet, I found someone who could do that and who could make code for me. So. Who did I find? I found Mr. Cyber Junkie. Nice name, nice guy. He's helped me a great lot. Not, on, not only with uh, this uh, system, but also a lot of other stuff. Uh, and he was quite well known already for two uh, big integrations. He has an official integration for Polar in the Home Assistant app. And also he has an unofficial uh, integration for P2000. P2000 is the paging system in Holland and it's used to send uh, SMSs and pager messages to our pagers. And I was thinking, well, he knows a lot about it already. Maybe he can help me. And he was very nice. He wanted to help me. So uh, what we did was we looked into that first, but it was actually not so fast because we had to get all these messages from uh, uh, the system first, and we wanted to go straight into the system of Fire Service Rota, also known as Brandweer Rooster. And there was actually a way, uh, as uh, Paulus was saying, we found uh, the API, and the people of Brandweer Rooster were nice enough to help us with that. So what we built is the following: we uh, we connected into the API for Brandweer Rooster. We have a web, web socket connection, it's called, and we get the incidents. So we get a lot of data from the incidents, but we also get more info than that. We get to know if someone is on duty or not. So it's on or off. And we have a switch that can say, uh, can, can you come to the, to the station? So it's called the incident response. Well, all of this, uh, can be used, of course, in un un unknown uh, ways before everyone can use it in his own matter. But uh, Cyber Junkie built this uh, interface and he uh, made this interface work like it can be uh, shown in a small screen, the Google Nest Hub. So if you have a Google Nest Hub, you can actually show this on the screen of your Google Nest. This is what it looks like. It's not very big. I don't think you can see it very well, but it has a map where the incident takes place. It has a list of all old incidents and it can actually speak the incident text, which is very useful because 
uh, it's also very nice if we can hear these incidents and don't have to read them because we're on our way to the fire station. Let me check if I have to do something else. No, I think we're okay still. Um, so I hear you think, what good is this to me? Because yeah, this is home assistant and uh, I'm not a firefighter. What good is it? Yeah, that's true. This is actually a system that's only useful for firefighters, but it's useful in a very uh, interesting way because what we do, we win a lot of time and we win precious seconds. We have uh, such a good connection with uh, Brandweer Rooster, also known as uh, Fire Service Rota, that we actually get the messages before they come to our pages. And that's what makes a hell of a difference because we can leave our house earlier than before. And that's sometimes 10 seconds, up to 15 seconds before the uh, message comes on our pager. And these seconds can make a difference between life and death. So in a way, you have a lot of uh, profit from the system, although you'll probably never be able to use it. But it's nice to know that it's possible with Home Assistant. There's a lot possible with that. Well, and now that I have your attention, I want to talk about something else because a lot of home automation is always about light, about comfort and whatever. But I think one of the things that you have to think about is safety in your house. So I want to emphasize that when you start home automating, start with smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors integrate them into your smart home because it can make a big difference for the life of you and your loved ones. And uh, I think it should be the first thing to install. Well, that's about it for me. I uh, hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you didn't have too much noise in the back. And uh, I hope to see you around. I'll stick around for a QA and a and uh, I wish you a pleasant evening. All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening. I know this is an international conference. I'm very happy to be here. I'm here to talk about Home Assistant and talk about the technology that my family can't live without, which is Home Assistant. Uh, my name is Marlon Buchanan. So today what I'll cover is a little bit of background about me, uh, basically why should you even listen to me? I'll talk about that for a little bit. Um, then I'll talk about my family's home assistant use. Um, and I'll do that in a day in the life format of my family using home assistant. So I'll kind of walk through what could happen in a day. And I, I can guarantee you that all the things do happen, but they don't necessarily happen in a given day, but they're all things do happen. So I'll walk through a day in the life and I'll talk about uh, my key home assistant integrations my key home assist automations, and what parts of home assistant my family uses the most. All right, so let's get started. A little background, a little bit about me. Uh, my day job, I'm an IT director at the University of Washington's Continuing College here in Seattle. Um, but my side gig, which is more relevant to this conversation, is that I run the Home Tech Hacker blog, where I do a lot of tutorials and product reviews and a lot of things around smart homes, and especially home assistant. And I'm the author of a book called The Smart Home Manual, which helps people plan and set up and, and configure their smart homes. I do have a software development background, but I don't code professionally. I wouldn't call myself software developer anymore. It's been about 20 years, but I've been dabbling in smart home technology for 15 years. All right, so our home assistant powered smart home. Uh, we've been using home assistant for about two years. We have over a hundred small smart devices in our house, um, including switches and bulbs and plugs. Uh, voice assistance, sensors, LED controllers, you name it, we've got we got some version of it in the house. We run Home Assistant Core in a Python virtual environment using an Ubuntu virtual machine. There are four users in this house that complicate all of my automations. Uh, there's me, my wife, and my two sons, ages 10 and 13. So here's kind of a graphical layout of, of kind of how our system works. Um, the interface layer, most of the interface is using um, voice um, that isn't automated, so uh, either Amazon's Assistant, I'll try not to trigger your uh, voice assistant, or Google Assistant and Home Assistant UI. 
Um, and we connect to those through Nab Nabucasa, which if you aren't using, you definitely should be. It makes things a lot easier. Um, the automation the integration engine is going to be around the Z-Wave or Zigbee stick that we use. Obviously, Home Assistant has all the brains and logic and integration. And then we use a Sonoff RF transmitter or receiver that's fast with Hasmoda to control some radio frequency devices. Um, and then the devices are cloud. I have a few of those that are that integrate via the cloud um, because I couldn't find a local integration for them. Um, as I mentioned, we have RF devices, radio frequency. We have IP devices, which are usually controlled via a REST interface. There's Z-Wipe, and then there's my favorite, MQTT, and then we have Zigbee devices. All right. So let's talk about some of the things I control and monitor via Home Assistant. So there's the lights. Um, those are the different ways, different types of lights we have. We have ceiling fans, deadbolts, garage doors, thermostats, uh, occupancy sensors, uh, multi-sensors which do temperature, humidity, light, etc. cetera. Uh, I've clued our irrigation controller into Home Assistant. Our home entertainment system, the AV uh, receivers and the uh, Roku and the TVs all, all integrate in. Uh, alarm system, uh, robot vacuum and uh, our home energy monitor. And then we have our Google Home, and I didn't mention here, but we also have a couple of Echo Dots as well. So let's talk about it, a day in the life at our house. And I'm just gonna walk through moment by moment and kind of give you an idea of how a home assistant integrates into each of these moments and talk about the automations real quick. Um, all right, so in the morning, it's the coffee. It's 3.30 a.m. and there's no rain forecast for today or tomorrow. So Home Assistant knows based on logic to turn the sprinklers on. I know there's at least a couple of you out there making a joke about no rain in the forecast in Seattle, but trust me, in the summers, there are days when there's no rain. Um, then around 5 a.m. we have the lights turn on and I could say Christmas lights, but we turned them on all year round with different themes. Different days have different things like Easter, 4th of July, sports teams. I'm a, being in Seattle, I'm a big Seahawk fan. Seahawks play at about, oh, 20 minutes. And so all our lights around here are themed as Seahawk lights right now. Uh, 5.30 a.m., how cold did it get overnight? Well, if it got pretty cold, it's time to turn on the hydronic heating to get us to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And 6.15, when we start wrestling and getting out of our beds, um, if it's still not warm enough, we have another heating system that's heat pump that can heat a lot more quickly. That'll come on to make sure we get there pretty quickly at the same time, which is nice because those two systems don't talk to each other otherwise. Um, but Home Assistant allows us to have those totally integrated and work as one system. Then 6.30 a.m. comes in and the kids are ready to watch TV. So they could just say, turn on the, the TV and then it would turn on the receiver to the right input. It would turn the uh, Roku on and also put that on the right inputs as well and, and the AV receiver and then they all be good to go. We're still in the morning and it's seven o'clock now, but the hydronic system turns off because the house is warm enough. And because they're integrated, once the hydronic system turns off, it knows to turn off the heat pump too, or the home assistant would just take care of that. And then at 7.30 a.m., it's sunrise, so it's time for the outdoor lights and LEDs to automatically turn off, which home assistant takes care of, no problem. Uh, we're all living in uh, COVID time, so a lot of us have our kids at home schooling virtually. So uh, a notification would come on at about 7.57 with a three minute warning that it's time for to start a school morning Zoom session. And it could turn the tear into TV off automatically, turn the AV receiver off, and power the subwoofer down too if the kids happen to still have the TV on, which they should not have it any on anymore at that point. And the power in the subwoofer off is nice because I tried to go through my house and figure out what's using electricity for no reason, and the subwoofer was one of those things. So it only comes on when the AV receiver is on, and then the smart plug would turn it off as soon as the AV receiver is off so that there's no wasted energy usage there. Um, we try to get the kids to go outside every once in a while. So if at 1030, my son wanted to go out and play, he could just ask Google to open the garage door. And if he left it open in about 10 minutes, I would get an alert that the garage door has been open, um, which would be fine if he's out there playing, but it's also useful in case we forget and go somewhere and leave the garage door open. Uh, in the afternoon, it's 12, it's time for the kids lunch break. And this is one of their favorites that they like to use. They like to play Nintendo Switch. Um, it's connected to a projector, so they could just tell uh, the Google to turn on the Nintendo, and then that would turn on the receiver, the projector. It would also uh, dim the lights a little bit or turn them on. It's really dark in the basement. The projector is old and takes a few minutes to warm up. So this one's a really useful one, so you can tell it in a few minutes in advance, and then when you get down there, you can just start getting play, get to playing, which the kids get a little impatient with. So that one's nice. And then at 1 p.m., let's say I get an alert from the generator that the generator's running. Well, there's no need for alarm. It's just a weekly test. And uh, there's just a vibration sensor on there that tells me when the generator's running and when it's not. 
Um, then it's 3 p.m. and one of the kids decides to go outside and play and then forgets to close the door. Well, I get a notification that the door is left open and then I could just go and close the door. The evening comes and it's time for the lights to come on again, whatever the decorative lights of the day are. And then at 6 p.m. after dinner, we like to get together and get cozy and watch TV. Uh, once again, I could ask Google to just turn the TV on. And to make it cozy, I could also ask Google to turn the fireplace on. Now, after the fireplace has been on around, we'll say around 7.30, been on for a while, um, it might get a little warm in there. And there's a temperature sensor that would automatically turn the fireplace off for safety precautions and tell us that that's why it turned it off. So at 7.30, let's say it gets warm enough and it automatically turns the fireplace off. And then uh, if we want to further uh, annoy the kids, at 9 o'clock, we have the lights flash and tell them it's time to go to bed. And then their mobile devices would lock for the night, which they don't really like. And then their bedroom LED lights turn on, which they do like. There's a little addressable LED strips attached to each of the boys' beds, which acts as a nightlight. They have nice little designs that can come on, and then they, they automatically come on, and they're ready to go when they're, when they're going to bed. So uh, then it's 9.30 p.m., and then my wife and I, which were early beds, early, um, we go to bed early, and we head upstairs for bed. There's a little button we can press, and it turns off all the lights on the main floor, turns on the lights that light a path going upstairs to our bedroom, and then it locks all the doors, and it announces that it's done all this through the Google Home speaker. If we forgot to do that, or we forgot to lock the doors, at 10.30 every day, the door, deadbolts automatically lock just in case we forgot them. And then at 11 o'clock, since no one's up watching anything and no one's outside looking at things, we want to conserve a little energy, the holiday lights and the themed LEDs turn off. And it'd be nice uh, if things are picked up around so they can run, then at 11.30 p.m., the robot vacuum can just go out and start doing a better job cleaning the floors than I ever do. So uh, I do have a couple of short demos that I'd like to show you real quick. Because um, it's kind of hard to demo um, smart home stuff without actually being in the smart home. So, but I did make a couple of different uh, videos that can show you a couple of different things. So here we go. And I have warning if uh, these are gonna, going to kick off a couple of commands to your assistant. So you may want to mute or just be prepared. Okay, you've been warned. Here they go. Hey Google, turn on the fireplace. So I promise you there's nobody going to the switch and hitting the switch after I said this. This is hey, actual automation. Turn the fireplace, the, sure. turn the fireplace off. Hey, Google, turn on Nintendo. So this is the automation I talked about a little bit earlier. Turn on Nintendo. And sorry for the screen resolution there. And I'm going to jump ahead in this video because, like I said, it takes a couple of minutes. Again, I promise you I did not go and do things manually to make that happen. That's just to save you time, two minutes of watching the projector warm up, and then you'll see Nintendo pop on. And then because hey, you're Google, lazy, you can just turn off Nintendo. Turn it off, and everything goes back to the way it was. All right. So that is basically how a couple examples of how things work. Uh, just to go over a quick uh, couple of automations real quick um, of how things work in our house. So we have for security, which is actually the one of the big reasons I got into smart homes. We have an alarm.com integrated system with Home Assistant. And then we have that integrated with other motion sensors. The alarm triggers lights, so that's a nice uh, safety warning. And it also triggers a voice audible response from Google Home. I mentioned the smart deadbolts that automatically lock they also tell us which code was used to come in in case we want to give a guest code out or we want to know which child entered a code. We have security light automations, which will basically emulate when we put the house in away mode, it'll actually emulate different lights coming on at different times to, to, to kind of fake that we're home. And then it automatically turns off when we get back based on our presence, that automation turns off. And then we have panic buttons strategically placed throughout the house, which if you press, it'll send a text message to my wife and I telling the location that was pressed and that there's some type of distress. And then we have door, garage, and garage door and generator notifications. Um, the entertainment ones are basically all the receivers and subwoofers and TVs are controlled by Home Assistant. You can turn them all on, control them, uh, put throw up volume and put them on the right inputs from Home Assistant. So that makes, you can write some pretty powerful automations that way. And almost all the LED lights are controlled, are powered by WLED and are controlled by Home Assistant 
Christmas lights and all those other things. And then the comfort and convenience. So we've got the robot vacuum automation, integrating the temperature system sensors and the two HVAC systems being home assistant, the fireplace automation, almost all light switches are either smart, motion activated or on timers. Most equipment is controllable by voice. The most difficult part there is naming things differently enough that the smart assistants can tell the difference. Um, then we have power monitoring, so we know how much how usage, how much electricity the house is using, and then we have the irrigation control. So thank you. Uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me. Um, if you want to learn more, I have articles about how I did most of that on, on my blog at hometechhacker.com. And you can find me on Twitter um, a lot, and you can find me on Facebook a little, and you can find me on Discord a little bit too, which is also Home Tech Hacker. Um, again, thank you for your time. Hello. Hello and welcome to the closing keynote. My name is Paulus Schoutsen. I hope you have enjoyed all the amazing talks. I definitely enjoyed them. If you missed the talk, or if you had like wanted to watch two talks at the same time and had to pick one, don't worry. We'll make sure that we're going to upload all the talks to YouTube in the coming weeks. I hope that you still have a little bit of attention left for the closing keynote, because we're going to have some exciting announcements that will shape the future of Home Assistant. And just to get Cut right to the chase. The first thing I would like to talk about is versioning. And to help me talk about that, I would like to invite Frank to the stage. Hey, Frank. Hey, how are you doing? Frank has been in charge of the Home Assistant releases in the last year, and he has done a phenomenal job. Well, he has you. become the de facto expert when it comes to Home Assistant versioning. So let's take a look at the Home Assistant versions and how it all started. So Home Assistant started with version 0 0.7. And, yeah. you know, I did was like, I decided, like, I picked the first version to be 0 0.7 because, you know, already pretty stable, we're pretty mature, we only have to add a few new features, and then it's going to be good. This was six years ago. And we're on 118 today. Yes. And so the next release, a lot of people are expecting this to be 190. Yeah, uh, no, maybe, may, no, uh, maybe not. Actually, no. No, we decided no. to change it up. That's not that. So, what do you think, Paul? There it is. The mighty 1.0. We finally did it. Well, we finally did it. Oh, hold, hold it right there, Paulus. Hold it. Oh, this is wait. no, this is not, this is, we're going, no, no, actually, we're going to do something different. Oh, are we like just gonna chop off the zero and then just go to 119? So it's like a continuous numbering. This has been suggested by a lot of people, right? Like, right, this, yeah. this makes total sense. Like, we just solved the problem. Just, yeah, it seems like zero. it could work. But actually, no, it's something different, even. Oh, wow. It's going really big. Yeah. We're going even higher. <laughs> oh. Can you guess what's coming? Yeah, you can guess. Like, you know, but of course. Wow. <laughs> That's bad acting, right? So here we are. <laughs> that is awesome. 2012. Home Assistant 2012. Here we are. And uh, I'm... Uh, going to explain you guys why and what's going on here. Okay. So, I'll log off. I'll see you, see you later, Paulus. So 
here I am. Can I get my slide on? Yeah, here we are. So the main question is, where is 1.0, right? And I guess the main reason for not having 1.0 at this point is because of what is displayed on the screen right now. With the tremendous power and flexibility of Home Assistant, any addition, improvement, or even tiny bug fix is most likely somebody else's breaking change. And we have been adding a lot of changes to the release notes lately. Like we, we mentioned every breaking change, covering every tiny change as well, like fixing a typo in a unit of measurement. But yet we always run into things that were breaking for people's use cases that we never thought of. So we have been running for the 1.0 milestone for a long time already. Goals have been stretched and adjusted quite a bit because, for example, our user base grew and changed. But also the world of IoT around us is rapidly changing as well, right? So did we ever made it to 1.0? I guess we have made it. I believe so. But what does 1.0 mean in the end, right? And various people have different ideas on that. Semantic versioning, for example, is a well-known set of rules that is often used. However, people rarely end up agreeing on what changes should go in which version. And let's be honest here, it's a number. It's just a number. So instead, we have chosen a new and different path, which I will talk to you about in a moment. First, let's talk about a beta of this release. If you have seen the rumors, it has been carrying the 1.0.0 uh, release marker. So why was that? It's an homage. It's an homage to the 1.0 milestone that everybody has worked hard on the past years. I think we made it. 1.0 is here, even though for just a moment and only for this beta. And that's something we should celebrate. Thanks everybody involved on making that milestone happen and congratulations to you all. So we are going with an easy versioning scheme that is human, recognizable and intuitive. Calendar versioning, also known as CalFer. The Home Assistant Core version number will be based on a year and month plus a patch number to indicate bug fix releases. The version number makes it easier to determine the age of the release you are running at your home. And today we are releasing Home Assistant Core 2020.12.0. This will also mean we are going to have a new release cycle. Instead of the three week cycle we have right now, we are going to change into a monthly cycle that matches this versioning strategy. A major new release of Home Assistant Core is planned every first Wednesday of the month. This is easier to remember than the previous three-week cycle that actually required a calendar, a calendar to keep track of. The beta is going to be unchanged. The beta week will take place the week before each release. The release in the new year will be Home Assistant Core 2021.1.0 which will be released on the first Wednesday of January, which is January the 6th of 2021. All right, that's all I had to tell. Enjoy Home Assistant Core 2012, sorry, 2020.12.0, I misspoke there, which will be available today. Hi, my name is Stefan and I work mainly on the Home Assistant operating system. Today we are proud to announce the first stable version of Home Assistant operating system release 5. So what's new in release 5? Release 5 comes with improved discovery features. So far we had multicast DNS which allows using homeassistant.local in URLs to find a fresh installation of Home Assistant. But it doesn't work reliably in all environments. LLMNR 
doesn't need the .local suffix and works particularly well in, wind in Windows and modern Linux environments. We improved the reliability of the core system service to start Home Assistant Supervisor. Corrupted containers or similar issues get detected more reliably and the system recovers automatically from it. We also improved the external data disk feature. Pascal mentioned it in the opening keynotes. It allows to run the operating system from the SD card and store the data on, the data on an external data disk such as a USB attached SSD drive. Moving data from the internal storage to the external data disk is now much faster. Finally, we updated our build system build root. This brings new versions of all software packages part of the OS image, such as systemd246 or version 3.0 of our security framework AppArmor. For the Raspberry Pis, we now moved to the Linux kernel 5.4, just like the latest release of Raspberry Pi OS. We also updated U-Boot 202010. With this, we can, we can support Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigs of memory, as well as the Compute Module 4. We did quite some testing with the 64-bit version and do recommend 64-bit image for Raspberry Pi 4 from release 5 onwards. There is now Odroid C4 support, a very cost-effective alternative to the Raspberry Pi 4 in a similar form factor. We also added Asus Tinkerboard S support, a variant of the Tinkerboard with the fast onboard eMMC storage. As usual in the past weeks, we made the several development builds using the release version 5, but today we release version 5.8 which is the first stable version of the release 5. It is based on Buildroot 2020.11. We will continue doing maintenance releases with security fixes, bug fixes, as well as small improvements as needed. For the future, we are aiming for two major releases a year, aligned with the Buildroot releases in February and August. So for release 6, we are aiming for March 2021 and it will be based on build root 2102. Our main goal for the operating system is reliability. We want it to be boring, essentially. We will keep using techniques used in reliable embedded systems, such as full disk image with fallback. The root file system will stay read-only. For those reasons, Home Assistant OS is not your everyday Linux distribution, and it will stay that way. There is no apt, there is no package manager. It's a single purpose Linux distribution meant to power Home Assistant. We are going to improve x86 support. We plan to add a generic 64-bit x86 image, which will work on all kinds of PCs. This one image will also be suited for virtualized environments and brings more drivers, which will make device pass-through functionality working in most situations. Lastly, we plan to add issue reporting also on operating system level. This will allow us to get detailed reports from crashes and other abnormal events happening in actual installations driving over homes and hopefully lead to faster bug fixes. No worries, privacy first. This will be opt-in only. Being busy with OS work, I don't have much time to improve my own home automation lately. I still have this trot free remote, which isn't doing anything. I've heard Bram has some exciting news to make that much easier to integrate than it used to be. I can't wait to try that out. Over to you, Bram. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Let's talk about automations. That's what home automation is all about anyway, right? So I'm doing a live demo today, so let's hope everything works. Um, I have a IKEA remote here, same as Stefan. So I should be able to help you out, Stefan. And 
This is meant to control a light. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to control this light over here. I hooked up the remote and the light to Home Assistant already. So the light is this table light over here. And if I toggle it, you see that the light toggles. But my remote doesn't do anything yet. So if I want to control my light with this remote in Home Assistant, I have to map every button of this remote to an action of the light. And when Home Assistant started, we didn't have a UI to create automation yet, and everything was done in YAML. So an automation would look like this. We had technical users back then, and they were willing to dive into technical stuff to make it work. As you see, we have a trigger here, and it's listed for an event. And it needs a lot of event data. And there's where it gets really technical. You have to go to the de developer tools. You have to listen to the events. You have to translate all the information you get from the event and create a trigger out of it. It's not easy. So luckily, we got a UI to create automations. We got things like device triggers and device actions. So now I can just select the device I want to use for my trigger, the remote, and I can select the trigger, the turn on button is pressed. And we can do the same for the action. I can select the device, table lamp, and I can tell it to toggle. OK, great. We created one automation for one button, four buttons left. The UI and device automations attracted a different type of user, a user that was less technical, but that's the same wish to automate their home. This means we now have two user groups, one that lives in the UI and one that lives in YAML. They use different tools, but they want to get to the same result, yet they can't share their work right now. The UI uses devices and device IDs, and they're not easy to remember or find. And the other group works mostly with entities. So as we've seen in the talk for Frank about automations, they use different syntaxes. But it would be so cool if people could just share their automations. Most of us use the same automations, and yet we have to build them all from scratch, taking a lot of time and a steep learning curve to build them. Wouldn't it be cool if you could just share your hard work with the rest of the community and to be inspired by the work of others. Today, we introduce a new feature of which we think can solve these issues. It's called Blueprints, and I'm going to show you how we can create this automation easily with Blueprints. So first of all, we have to go to the configuration panel. And there we find this new section called Blueprints. Let's go into there. And we see two blueprints here, but no blueprint that can help us with this remote. So let's discover some more blueprints. We click on the button here. And we have a new section in our community forums. It's called Blueprint Exchange. And it's specifically designed for sharing your blueprints. Um, this was a beta feature. So our beta users have been playing around with this. So we have a few blueprints already. And here I see uh, IKEA five button remote for lights. That sounds perfect. Yes, that's the remote we want to use. Thank you, Frank, for this blueprint. And as you can see, it is YAML. It's pretty advanced, but it doesn't have to be this advanced. OK, now let's use it. How does it work? So to import a blueprint in Home Assistant, we have to copy the URL of the form topic. Then we go back to the configuration panel for our blueprints. We press Import Blueprint. Here we can enter a URL. This can be a URL of a GitHub blueprint or a community form like we just copied. So let's paste in the URL and click Preview Blueprint. This takes longer than normal, but hopefully it still works. Yes, there it is. 
We get a description of the blueprint, control the lights with an IKEA five button remote. That sounds like what we want. Okay, so we press import blueprint. And now we got a new row here with the blueprint. So let's create an automation with this blueprint. We click create automation. And here we have the blueprint. We got a description here. And then we have to pick a remote. Of course, this automation needs to know what devices to use for this automation. So a blueprint can specify what inputs it supports. So in this case, this blueprint specified it needed a device. So the UI shows a device picker, but it also specified it needs a specific device, an IKEA device with a specific model number. So this blueprint can show in the UI only devices that will actually work with this blueprint. So if I open this device picker, I only get one device back as that's the only one that will work with this blueprint. Okay, that's great. Now to the lights. As we've seen before, some people use entities, some use devices, and some use areas. And in Home Assistant, we didn't really have something that worked with all these things. So we added it. It's called a target. And a target can contain areas, devices, and or entities. For this specific blueprint, it specified the entities had to be of the light domain, of course. So when I pick an area, I only get to see areas that contain lights. So let's pick my bedroom. And now I have the area here. But actually, I don't want to automate all the devices in my area. As an area is very, very convenient, as when I add a device to my area, I don't have to update my automation as that device will automatically be targeted by the automation. I only want to automate this light. So when I press the arrows here, I can expand this area into the devices it contains. And then I can simply delete the device I don't want. OK, now we have the remote we want to use, the light we want to use. Let's save it. And now it should work. So if we click the remote, it turns off. When we click it again, it turns on. And when we dim it down, it actually dims down. That's great. Live demo worked. So as we've seen, blueprints are written in YAML. And any automation can be turned into a blueprint and be made reusable. You can create a blueprint that can be used in multiple automations to be used in multiple rooms, for example. But it really shines for shareabilities. Automations we can all use. So as we've seen, Home Assistant ships with two default blueprints. One blueprint that will act on motion devices to turn on your lights. And one that will tell you when a person leaves the zone, it will send an automation to your mobile app. But there is so much more possible. Think of notifying you when the dryer is done. Pause a media play when you get an incoming call. Get a notification when the batteries of a device run low. The possibilities are endless. You can all create blueprints for it, and everyone can just use it. And while browsing the blueprints of others, you might get ideas you never thought of before. Today, we launched the first version of Blueprints, and we have a ton of extra features in mind that we still want to add to Blueprints. But I think with the current version, we already changed the way we will do automations in Home Assistant. That's it for Blueprints. If you want to know more about Blueprints, about creating them, and how it all works, check out the documentation that will be online later today. It includes a really nice tutorial on creating blueprints. I will now pass you on to Paulus, who also has some excited news for you. Happy automating. All right. Blueprints are amazing. It makes it possible for us to take all the home automation expertise that lives inside our community and make it available to everybody. 
imagine being able to take one of Thomas Lovens animations and just make it work for your home without, without by just configuring all the entities. This is going to be so good. And it also allows our advanced users to automate their homes more efficiently than ever before. But I'm not here to talk about blueprints, because I'm here to talk about something else, hardware. This is the Odroid M2 Plus. It is a board that has been added as a supported device uh, to our operating system in the last year. It is a little bit more expensive than a Raspberry Pi 4. It comes with a heatsink and has a real-time clock on board powered by a battery. It is slightly faster than a Raspberry Pi. The single, CPU, uh, co single core CPU benchmarks come in at 20%, multi-core CPU benchmarks come in at 60, and the memory bandwidth is around twice as fast. But the kicker is, the Odroid N2 Plus is so much faster than a Raspberry Pi because the input-output blows it away. See, the Odroid N2 Plus is 22 times faster doing input and output. It is actually, uh, an input and output means it's reading and writing data to a disk. It means your logbook will fly. It means your history will be so fast in Home Assistant. Restarting Home Assistant, doing updates, all these things are super fast. And to be fair, this is, this is actually not really a fair fight because a Raspberry Pi still uses SD cards, and those are slow, while the Odroid N2 Plus uses eMMC flash storage, and that's just really, really fast. Another thing that is really great about the Odroid N2 Plus is that from the bootloader on up, everything is open source. And that means when something is broken, we can go in and fix it. Over the last year, we have worked with well-respected Linux kernel uh, consultancy firm Bay Libre to find and squash bugs inside the Odroid N2 Plus to make it sure it works perfectly with the latest Linux versions. We've also made sure that the fixes we found were being upstream back to Linux so that anyone with an Odroid N2 Plus, even if you don't use Home Assistant, can use all these bug fixes. The N2 Plus really, really is a great device to run Home Assistant. I even would go so as much as saying that right now, it is the best way to run Home Assistant if you take into account speed, price, and reliability. It actually has more power than Home Assistant today needs, which means that it's future-proof. It can easily run hundreds of integrations and thousands of automations. But there's one thing about the Odroid N2 Plus that I really, really don't like. It just doesn't look that good. Like if you look at it, if you first hear how great it runs Home Assistant, and then it comes in this look, that doesn't match up. It needs to look better. So we asked ourselves, can we do better? Can we make a great case for the Odroid N2 Plus? And the answer was no, we can't. But we were able to team up with somebody that could. So together with Rick Haan, we designed a beautiful Home Assistant case. It comes in any color that you like, as long as you're able to 3D print it. This case consists out of three printed parts that form together an amazing case. The top part contains a beautiful uh, Home Assistant logo engraved into the, uh, into the roof. We're going to publish these models today for free. This way, anyone will be able to print their own case and have an N2 Plus that is stylish, reliable, and private. Okay, actually, there's still a problem. Not many people have a 3D printer. In fact, 3D printers are so niche, many people don't know anyone with a 3D printer. And plastic is great, but it doesn't give that premium feel that running Home Assistant on an N2 Plus deserves. So we have done something that we have never done before. We left our comfort zone of making software, and we decided to get this case manufactured. And this was a lot of fun, because we have learned so many new things. It was also super, super frustrating from times because, well, it was all new to us. Timing-wise, doing this during the pandemic, also not ideal. So before I go into more detail, let me start with a photo of the case, which we call Home Assistant Blue. The Home Assistant Blue case is made of, out of aluminum, out of three separate parts. The top part is made with aluminum extrusion and anodized in blue. The front and back parts are cut out by a CNC machine from a solid piece of aluminium and chrome plated. Let me take it, uh, I've got one here. 
This case is really, really beautiful. Wherever it's in the house, it will not go unnoticed. For the design of the Home Assistant Blue Case, we have been inspired by kitchen appliances from the 70s that have bright colors and have shiny metal. And depending on where you're gonna put it in your house, you can actually turn the top part around to either align the logo with the port or align the logo with the front of the case. This has been our first foray into making something. It's been a learning experiment, and that's why we've created only a limited run of these cases. To distribute and sell these cases to our community, we've teamed up with Heart Kernel, the creator of the Odroid M2 Plus. Together with Heart Kernel, we're going to sell the Home Assistant Blue Bundle. When you buy the Home Assistant Blue Bundle, you're going to get a limited edition Home Assistant Blue case. It will include an Odroid N2 Plus with four gigabytes of memory, which is the fastest and available N2 Plus. You're gonna get 128 gigabytes of eMMC storage, which is the largest size amount eMMC storage available for the Odroid N2 Plus, and it will have Home Assistant pre-installed. It will also include a power adapter for your region, and the case and all its parts will be pre-assembled. And because the N2 Plus is an officially supported device for Home Assistant, we will make sure that it's going to be able to run the latest version of Home Assistant for years to come. We have been making Home Assistant easier for a couple of years now. Easier to onboard, easier to configure integrations, to set up Lovelace dashboards, and to automate your home. And Home Assistant Blue bundle comes with Home Assistant pre-installed. This is not a special version of Home Assistant. No, this is the exact same version you can download from our website when you download the Odroid N2 Plus image. And this means that if you want to get started when you, the Home Assistant Blue Bundle arrives in your house, you plug in the ethernet cable to connect it to the internet. You plug in the power cable to connect it to the power. And after that, you can use our mobile companion apps to onboard or use a browser or your computer. You will be up and running in 10 minutes. The Home Assistant Blue Bundle will be sold directly by Heart Kernel for $140. It will also be available via various resellers in the United States and Europe. These resellers will handle shipping and import duties from Korea, so you can get the bundle fast and worry-free. To buy a Home Assistant Blue Bundle, you can visit our Home Assistant website and start your 2021 in style. Thank you. Thank you, Paulus. So this concludes the talks for the event. I want to thank our viewers on YouTube. That stream will now end, but the conference is not over yet. Now it's time for some interactive sessions where you get a chance to talk to a couple of our developers, see how the Home Assistant podcast is recorded, or get inspired how to design your loveless front end. We'll also have sessions about the Home Assistant Blue Bundle and the new Blueprints feature. If you've been watching on YouTube and want to join our interactive sessions, it's not too late to get a ticket. Go to our event page on Hopin, get a ticket, and join the fun. Finally, I want to thank all the people and organizations that have helped organize the conference. And a special thanks to our speakers and sessions hosts. Thank you, and good evening.